All right. Hi, everybody. Ooh, let me mute my other computer. Hi, so my name is Emily and I'm going to be behind the scenes for our lovely event this afternoon. But I wanted to go over a couple rules before I introduced our guest today, Ed. Um, so you'll see that there's a chat section down below and a Q&A section. So the chat section is really for you to chat with each other, send some love to our panelists here, um, and have some fun. If you have a question that you really want Ed to answer later that relates to the bees that we're going to learn about or the wannabes, go ahead and put it in the Q&A and that's where we're going to make sure that we try our best to answer those questions. So um, don't put them in the chat. We're not gonna monitor that as closely as the Q&A. We're also gonna have a lot of fun polls that will come up for you to answer. So have your um, mouse at the ready to learn some more about bees in your backyard. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Dr. Ed Spivak, who's going to be our presenter today. He is the curator of invertebrates at the St. Louis Zoo and also the director of the St. Louis Zoo's Center for Native Pollinators. So go ahead and take it away, Ed. Can you hear me and see the slides? Anybody? <laughs> Emily, can you hear I can hear you. Oh, okay, good. So uh, thank you all. Uh, happy National Pollinator Week. It's kind of a strange National Pollinator Week. Uh, we usually have our dinner this week, a few other things going on, but uh, these webinars, I think that we have two of them this week, I think are going to be, I think, hopefully fun and uh, informative. Let you guys kind of experience your gardens, maybe in a little bit different way. Before we start, as Emily mentioned, we're going to be doing some polling. And I'd like to start off with our first poll question, just to kind of find out who is participating, what your sort of backgrounds are. So if you could answer the question, and you can answer, you can choose more than one uh, category for yourself. Feel free to apply. So hopefully you're all filling out that uh, little questionnaire. As I said, it's, it's kind of nice to find out who uh, I'm speaking to and also your sort of backgrounds. You know, if you are a teacher, if you already know a lot about bees uh, or if you're just kind of curious or just a zoo member and want to support the St. Louis Zoo, uh, particularly during these times when we can't necessarily all get to the zoo. So do we have uh, any answers yet for the, the first poll? All right, got people interested in bees. That's really good because that's what we're going to be talking about. And also a lot of gardeners. So we're going to be talking a little bit about gardening. We're going to talk about even more on Thursday and how you can attract the bees. But I really want to start talking about the bees and give an idea of what we're really trying to, to see and do. So first off, bees are a group of pollinators. Pollinators are very just going to reduce this here. Here we go. Um, I just lost a picture. Oh well. Uh, so pollinators are a very diverse group of animals. Uh, many of them we're sort of familiar with. Uh, bees, of course. Uh, butterflies, moths, beetles, wasps, bats, uh, some birds. In other parts of the world, there are black and white rough lemurs. There are some slugs. There are some amphipod crustaceans, there are ants, there's a whole group of animals which are regarded as pollinators. And we need pollinators because 90% of our flowering plants, about 400,000 species, depend to some extent on animal pollination, meaning they need an animal to move pollen from the male parts of the flower to the female parts of the flower so that we can produce, well, plants can produce the next generation, but also the fruits, nuts, and seeds, which many of us rely on. Bees, in general, are probably the most important group of pollinators for a couple of really big reasons. One is they actually collect pollen. A number of plants have devised ways to actually attach pollen 
to an animal so that it gets transported. But bees are actively collecting pollen. That is what they're feeding their kids. That's the proteins, fats, vitamins, lipids, all those things. They also show what's called flower constancy, which means that, for example, if a bee is on, say, goldenrod flower, it will go to a goldenrod flower to a goldenrod. If it's on aster, aster, aster. Going from a goldenrod to an aster doesn't help the plant, doesn't help pollination. So this flower constancy can be very important. From sort of our perspective, 75% of our crop species worldwide require pollinators. Over $29 billion of our, crop, of our, value of our crops depend on honeybees and native bees. Worldwide, up to $577 billion. And about one out of every three mouthfuls of food and drink we consume depends upon pollinators. Now, why it's three quarters of our crops, but only one third of our diet, it's because much of our diet are what are called wind pollinated plants. So corn, rice, wheat, barley, oats. Now you can survive on that, not very healthfully. Um, how long? Who knows? But if you care for color, flavor, nutrition, you really want to think about the pollinators and particularly the native bees. And it's also really not just about us. We often tend to think of ourselves first, but think of the birds in your backyard, you know, feeding on the fruits or seeds produced from pollination, the box turtles in Forest Park feeding on ground strawberries, or depending upon where you are, if you've got black bears, field mice, all of these animals feeding on fruits and nuts and seeds that are dependent upon pollination. Now pollinators though have been really in trouble for the past couple of decades for a variety of reasons. And this is actually a lot of the reasons why a lot of species are disappearing. Loss of habitat and fragmentation, invasive plant species, in particular taking away those food resources for the bees, changes in agricultural practices, misuse of pesticides, disease and parasites, pollution, competition with introduced species. It really is something a little bit of a downer but we can really do something about it by educating ourselves on bees. And I wanna give a quick idea of why I'm talking about bees in general. It's really about all the different types of bees. Oftentimes we tend to think of just about honeybees and we can pollinate our crops with honeybees, but this is just a simple study which looked at honeybee pollination and apples. And you could get apple production with honeybees, but if you then had a whole diversity of native bees, and look at the bees in this picture, starting at the top left, Andrina carlini in the center, blue orchard mason bee, small carpenter bee in the top right, two spotted bumblebee on the left, another mining bee in the bottom, that all these bees are a little bit different in size, we'll talk about that in a moment, and they all work the flower a little bit differently. So because of that, you get actually much better apple production. You get higher seed and fruit set, larger, better form fruits. So from an economic point of view for a orchardist, they can actually do better. But from a health point of view too, you're actually getting a healthier product too. And what I really want you to understand is about bee diversity, not necessarily just bee abundance. And that's why this presentation I'm giving today, I think is important. We really need to understand the diversity of bees. If we're going to be helping bees, we need to understand there's more than one kind of bee out there we need to see what all the different types are, how they utilize the environment, what they need. But as I said, oftentimes people tend to think of just this species. So we've got another poll question here for you all. How many different types of bee species are there in North America? Let's see what people think. Give it some time. Well, hopefully after that song, it was poll results. Wow, this is a fairly educated group. Over half of the group has said over 4,000 species. 36% um, said 400. Um, no one said four. Very good. So what we're looking at here, we have over 20,000 species worldwide, but here in North America, it's around 4,000 species. In Missouri alone, we have over 470 species. And just in the St. Louis area, we published a paper a couple of years ago, and we're still adding species to it. 
We've so far identified over 201 species of bees just for the St. Louis area. And we define St. Louis as from the Mississippi River to what's called the I-270 belt. So it's kind of the, not necessarily the greater St. Louis area, but a good portion of St. Louis, which includes the city and the county. There's incredible diversity of bees out there. And one thing that you'll find out as we're talking today, there's incredible diversity in size. This is a picture of the smallest bee in North America, Perdita minima, has no common name. It's only two millimeters long. The face you might recognize, if you have a wooden deck, porch, soffit, fascia, carport, uh, that is the face of a large carpenter bee female, which is one of our largest bees. Not necessarily the largest bee here in North America, but one of the largest ones. We're gonna be talking about that one again in a moment. So when you're out in your garden, as I said, it's really about bee diversity. We want people to understand, oh, look at all these different types of bees, and you start spreading that information. But what really makes a bee? What are the distinguishing characteristics of a bee? One is they're hairy. That hairiness is what allows them to collect pollen. And we're gonna talk about in a second, they have these pollen collecting structures. They have long tongues, but there are some short tongued bees too that they need to get to the nectar and the flowers. And in general, they're vegetarians. So when we think of things like wasps, those are, for the most part, many of them are carnivorous. They're feeding their young uh, animal protein of one sort or another, whereas bees are feeding pollen and nectar. So they are vegetarians. And they come in a variety of social styles, solitary, gregarious, semi-social, social. So when we look at a bee, what is a bee? Well, first off, a bee is an insect. It has three basic body parts. There's a head, thorax, and abdomen. It has six legs, two antenna, and for bees, they also have four wings too. But one of the big characteristics of bees is collecting pollen. So where they collect pollen really varies depending upon the group. And this also helps you to identify sometimes what group the bee is. So this is going to help you identify those bees in the garden. So this is a uh, female uh, sunflower longhorn bee, and they have these incredibly long hairs on their hind legs. This whole group has these long hairs on their hind legs. Kind of think of them as, you know, big uh, pantaloons or for any older individuals in the group, you know, MC Hammer kind of pants. So they're filled and they will often fill them with pollen. One whole group this is the megachylids, which are the leaf cutters, the mason bees, resin bees. They don't have hairs on their legs. They have hairs on the underside of their abdomen. So when you see this, and we'll talk about it again in a moment, when you see this, this is an easy way to identify the entire family. And then you have honeybees and also the bumblebees have these unique pollen baskets where you have these nice discrete patches of pollen located on their legs. And this is only for honeybees and bumblebees. Now to help you identify things further, you can go to the St. Louis Zoo's website in a couple locations under do-it-yourself conservation, also pollinator center. There is a downloadable Missouri Bee Identification Guide, which gives you a general idea of some of the bees that you can find in the garden. And I'm gonna be using this as sort of a template to my talk today as a general introduction to the diversity of bees in your garden. So some of the major bee groups, these aren't necessarily by taxonomy. They're more or sort of common names. Some are uh, taxonomic groups, but we're gonna talk about honeybees, bumblebees, carpenter bees, longhorn and squash bees, mason leaf cutter bees, sweat bees, digger bees, and polyester bees. Now, that's a lot of different types of bees, but I'm trying to figure out how best to kind of emphasize or allow you to identify them in the garden. And sometimes it's easier just by size. So you've got big bees, medium bees, and small bees. And I put this picture up. The two types of biggest bees you're going to find in your garden are bumblebees and the large carpenter bee. The easiest way to tell them apart is look at their butts. And oftentimes this is what you, is easy to see too because they're often face down in the flower. If it has a hairy butt, it is a species of bumblebee. If it has a shiny butt, it is a large carpenter bee. 
This is the easiest way to tell this group apart. Now we only have one large carpenter bee here in the Eastern United States. If you get, go out west, there are several species, but we're lucky. You see the large carpenter bee, it's only one species, you'll know what it is. Bumblebees, we have several species. So large carpenter bees, as I said, black body, uh, light and dark hairs. They're similar to bumblebees. People often confuse them with bumblebees. They'll say, oh, I, oh, I see this bumblebee in the yard and then I look and I see that shiny butt. Nope, large carpenter bee. Uh, males are stingless, and this is a characteristic of all bees. Only the females of any species can potentially sting because that stinger is actually a modified egg laying device called an ovipositor. Now, since no male lays an egg, they don't have stingers, so no male bee can sting you. But even then, all of these other bees, it is very, very difficult to get any of our native bees to sting you. They don't really they're not aggressive. They don't really want to be bothered by you, which stinging you is actually being bothered by you. They just want to go about collecting pollen and nectar, raising kids, setting up their houses. So we often notice the large carpenter bees. They're the ones who drill these beautiful holes in wood. Um, they do this just with their mandibles. Um, and if you ever get a chance to actually look inside one of these holes, they're beautifully sanded too. They are just really gorgeous and they divide the individual cells where they lay their eggs with basically particle board. The sawdust, they mix with a little bit of saliva and separate their areas. So sometimes you actually just may see them digging a hole right into your yard. I, you know, I don't get bothered by these bees. Uh, some people get concerned that, oh, they're gonna, you know, my porch is gonna fall down, my carport, whatever. It would take an awful lot of bees to do this and for an awful long amount of time. The example I give is the insectarium at the St. Louis Zoo. We have an arbor above the entrance and the exit, wooden arbor. The building is now 20 years old. Those arbors have been nesting sites for large carpenter bees for 20 years and they're still going strong. Now the one large carpenter bee you may see often are the males. These are the ones who set up territories, they're basically creating an area where they think a female might nest or some flowers where they think the female is going to be collecting pollen and nectar. So they are, sorry, they are then patrolling their neighborhoods. They're the ones which sometimes people get a little concerned about because they may fly right in your face, but remember they can't sting you at all. They're just trying to intimidate you. And when you think about it, a little bee like this intimidating a five to six foot person is kind of impressive, but they're nothing to worry about whatsoever. Now you can easily tell males from females for the large carpenter bee. This is a female, it has a black face, whereas the males have this yellow mask or mustache. They also have larger eyes too to be able to see the females better with too. So you can very easily tell, you know, if it's a male or female in your garden. Bumblebees, the other group of large bees you'll find in a garden, as I said, they're hairy, black body, they're often covered with yellow hairs, brownish, maybe a little bit of an orange. Um, they are also social. So one of the truly social bees next to honeybees. Many of them around here nest underground or any sort of cavity they can find. We have a lot of different species of bumblebees here in Missouri. We have actually 10 species of bees, bumblebees. So some of them that you might find in the garden are the Eastern bumblebee, and they're really identifiable by the various hair patterns. We're not really gonna get into that. You can find that in a guide I'm gonna mention in a moment. I just want you to realize you can still notice that very hairy butt and the patterning. This is the brown belted bumblebee. There's this little brown band on their uh, abdomen. The black and yellow bumblebee, which is one of the largest bumblebees along with the American bumblebee. These are the two largest bumblebees that you're gonna find in the garden. The two-spotted bumblebee has these two little, looks like spots or little tabs on its abdomen. Now, when I mentioned that bumblebees are large bees, there's also a lot of diversity in size. So this is in a colony of Eastern bumblebee. This is a queen, which are the largest members of the group. These are some workers, and particularly some species like Eastern bumblebees and brown belted. The earliest workers that you're going to see in the spring are actually really rather small. Uh, they can be smaller than honeybees sometimes. So even though it is a large bee, you will tend to see some of these smaller individuals. 
And as I mentioned, also on the zoo's website, you can download a guide to the bumblebees of Illinois and Missouri, uh, giving an idea of the 10 species that are commonly found in uh, Missouri and the 11 in Illinois. Now, medium bees. The medium bees are really diverse in size. Probably the one that people uh, see most readily and possibly identify more easily are the honeybees. Honeybees are characterized by a heart-shaped head, but they also have hairy eyes. And we'll see a picture of this in a moment. It's the only bee that's, that we have here that actually has hairy eyes. There's actually little hairs actually coming out of the eyes between the different facets of the eyes. One thing that often confuses people is they come in a variety of colors. Of course, they are social, as I mentioned. When we start looking at the colors, here you can see what looks like your kind of standard striping pattern. This is in a typical hive. Honeybees are the only ones which make these beautiful hexagonal cells in, and create these hives for themselves. And as I said, when you start looking at the colors, you can see this looks like a kind of a typical honeybee. This one though is kind of half black. This one has almost an all black abdomen. I've also seen it with all black thoraxes too. But here's one which is basically all amber in color. So that's there is a wide diversity in honeybee coloration because of all the different varieties and subspecies that have been brought here to North America. Honeybees are not native. They were first introduced around 1621 or so into North America, the United States. So they are not a native bee. The longhorn bees and squash bees, many of them are just coming out now. Uh, they can be kind of stout, robust, hairy, but and many of them are also specialists on a variety of flowers like asters and sunflowers and daisies, etc. But one of the big characteristics of this group is with the males. They're called longhorn bees because of these long antennae. This is a sunflower longhorn bee. This is a male. Here's a female. You can see her antennae are much shorter, but now you also see those long hairs on the legs. Notice again that the males do not have those hairs on the legs. It's only the females who are collecting pollen. Another longhorn bee, this one is a specialist on ironweed and their relatives. See the long antenna and the female. Here you can see pollen loaded on her hind legs. This one is probably the most common longhorn bee that we'll see. And actually I saw my first one this year just at lunch today out in our garden. This is the two-spotted longhorn bee. And whereas many of the longhorn bees tend to be specialists on just a few varieties of plants, the two-spotted longhorn bee is what's called really Catholic in its taste or polylectic. They will feed on a variety of different types of pollen and nectar. It's also one of the few all black bees we have around here. And they can easily be identified, particularly when they're face down in a flower, they've got these two white flashes on their abdomen to be able to identify them. That's what gives them the name two-spotted. And here's a male. Here you can see again, the long antenna of the male. Sometimes you actually might find the males gathered in your garden just sleeping together. So a number of bees, particularly like the longhorn bees, uh, large carpenter bees will also be fine sleeping. Uh, they will sometimes sleep in these aggregations on dead vegetation. And I'll be talking about this again on Thursday on things you need to do to protect these habitats and support the bees, whether it's for nesting or just for sleeping. The sunflower bee, which is a specialist on sunflowers and relatives, this is one of the bigger longhorn bees. This is a female, here you can see its hind legs packed with pollen. The squash bee is also a type of longhorn bee. If any of you are growing squashes, um, like butternuts, um, any of them with the large tubular flowers, you may eventually get squash bees. They will find your flowers. The males actually sleep in the blossoms, whereas the females are going back and forth between flowers during the pollination. Digger bees is a group called Andrenidae. They are predominantly found in the spring, though there are some that can be found throughout the year and also in the fall. They're very diverse in size. Um, they carry their pollen a little bit differently. They do have the hairs on their legs, but they also, the hairs run all the way up even into their back, like they're carrying pollen even up into their armpits. The one characteristic which sets them apart is what's called these shallow depressions of fovea between their eyes. So here's the, the face of one of these mining bees. And here you can see these little lines of hair. Now, 
I'm pointing out some of these characteristics that, oh, I don't see that. This is where you train your eye, just as if you're a birder or any, or looking at flowers, eventually you start seeing these characteristics. And eventually, once you start getting used to looking at the uh, bees in your backyard, in your garden, you'll start seeing some of these things too. There are a whole variety, Andrina carlini. Unfortunately, many of them don't have common names. Andrina perplexa. Andrina riginea. This is actually a specialist on spring beauties, one of the smaller of the bigger bees, or the money bees. The polyester and cellophane bees are also a group, particularly often found during the spring. Uh, they also have a heart-shaped face. They tend to be hairy, great at tawny. Uh, very cute. This is the spring polyester bee on a red bud. Um, looks a little bit kind of honeybee-like, but it's really more gray in color. The bands are much more distinctive. Now, I'm showing a lot of these things just give it, give you this flavor. I don't expect everyone to go out right away and go, oh, that's polyester bee. That's this kind of bee. <clears throat> I just want you to start getting excited and being able to start seeing the diversity of bees in the backyard. Spring polyester bees, like many of our bees, are also ground nesting bees, and I'll talk about this again on Thursday and setting up habitats for them. But here you can also see that heart-shaped face. The leafcutter and mason bees, this is that group that I mentioned, which are characterized in particular by where they carry their pollen on the underside of their abdomen. Uh, they range from grays to blacks to uh, sometimes greens in color. But here you can see those long hairs on the abdomen. So immediately when you see this, you can identify that's family Megachylidae. Here's a blue orchard mason bee. You can see that pollen being collected on the underside of its abdomen. So the mason bees are those probably out in the spring. They are some of the best pollinators for spring uh, trees, orchard trees. So if you do have things like apples, plums, et cetera, you may see these bees out there along with the mining bees. This is Osmia georgica, one of the smaller of the mason bees, but here you can still see that pollen right on the underside of the abdomen. Very easy to identify this entire family. They've got a bees like Megcala mendica. Here you can see the hairs, it hasn't started collecting pollen yet. Megcala nimica, one of our largest ones. Here you just really can't see underneath its abdomen, but one of the largest of our leafcutter bees we have around here. And within the leafcutters and masons, there are other bees which use different materials. Uh, this is a small resin bee, but you can see that characteristic pollen. To give you an idea of size, this is Monarda or bee balm. So this is a very small bee. Actually, I saw two different species uh, at lunch today. Actually, when I was out in the garden at lunch, I saw 14 different species of bees, at least 14 different species of bees uh, in our garden, just in looking around for about 15, 20 minutes. And then the wool carter bee, and I mentioned this again, this one is also, we have some native carter bees. This one is actually not a native, it was accidentally introduced. But if you've got plants like lamb's ear, um, ours were around our foxglove beer tongue, these are the ones which can kind of set up these territories, little pugnacious little bees, really cute. And then there's a group called the cuckoo bees, which look very wasp-like. They're found in various families, but these are ones which uh, do not collect pollen. They actually lay their eggs in the nests of other species of bees. I look at them as when you see them, that is a good sign that you have the host of those bees around. So to me, this is a good sign seeing them. So when you see something like the nomadas, which are often red to orange, often all scarlet with cream and white patches, and you can see there's no hairs for collecting pollen. Celioxes, which is a type of leaf cutter, but this group also you see there's no hairs on the underside of its abdomen, has a very pointy abdomen, almost kind of wasp-like. This is a parasite, the optoparasite on the other leaf cutters. Triopiolus. This one looks like a large wasp, but it's actually a bee. This one is actually a specialist on sunflower bees. Now we talked about the large bees, the mini bees, and now the small bees. These are the ones which often get, you know, unnoticed. And I'm going to go through three different groups. We've got the masked bees, the small carpenter bees, and the sweat bees. The small carpenter bees are actually very common you know, around here. Uh, they can be found throughout the year. They look kind of ant-like. They are shiny, dark, metallic blue-green. They'll appear almost uh, black, a cylindrical abdomen. They are very small to give you an idea of size. This flower is a ridgeron or fleabane, which is about the size of a dime. 
So this gives you an idea of the size of this bee. The interesting thing is, once you get used to seeing them, you can actually start sexing them too because they have these unique facial markings. Males have this inverted T and females just have this little dash for the species we have around here. So this is a small bee and also you call a short tongue bee, so shorter flowers in order to feed them. The sweat bees are a very diverse group. Uh, they range from browns to blacks, beautiful metallic greens, some incredibly small, some even close to medium size. One of the more common ones we have around here, the fluorescent green metallic sweat bee. This is a female with her black and white abdomen and beautiful green head and thorax. This is the silky striped sweat bee of Hosnesrisius. Here it's all green, but you can still see some banding patterns on its abdomen, unlike some of the other green sweat bees. Electus legatus, this is a very common one that you can find on a lot of things like whether it's flea bane or coreopsis. Uh, stripe pattern, you can see the hairs, they're all brown, and legatus has this kind of largish brown head. And lazy glossums, some of these are some of the smallest bees. This is also a flea bane, so really about the size of a dime, so you can get an idea of how big they are. But compared to the other small bees, you can still see this obvious kind of hairy banding pattern that you don't see on the small carpenter bees or the mask bees, uh, the mask bees we'll see in a moment. And this is Agachlora pura, green metallic sweat bee. Unlike the Agapostamon, you don't see the banding patterns on the abdomen. And also, once you get used to seeing some of these, you don't see the, what looks like uh, little dents, uh, punctations in the head and thorax. Sometimes you might just see these guys looking out you know, from a hole in the ground because they are ground nesting bees. This is Agapostum and uh, Viricens, and this is a little Lazia glossum looking out from their nesting holes. And then the last group of small bees are the masked bees. I actually saw my first masked bees also at uh, lunch today too. These are very small bees. And they're unique in that unlike the others, and actually I think I'll go to the female first, unlike the uh, other bees, they do not have structures on their bodies to collect pollen. They actually swallow the pollen and store it inside, which they take back to their nests. Now they're called mass bees. They look very little wasp-like. They're called mass bees because of this facial pattern they have. So the males have either a, a white or yellow mask on their face. Uh, here you can see this is very small. You can also see little banding patterns on the legs and on the thorax. Uh, this is, by the way, fennel to give you an idea of the size. This is a female. Females have these two white or yellow flashes on their face. This is common milkweed to give you an idea of size of this bee too. Or a better idea of size, this is in a nesting hole. This is only one eighth inch in diameter. And it's also a type of cellophane bee. So this is one where it's secreting this polyester cellophane-like material to line their nests. Now, sometimes, this last group, before we get into some identification and get you guys involved, and I know we're, we've got some time, and I think hopefully you're gonna still sticking with me. Sometimes you can kind of figure out what the bee is just by where you might find it. So specialist bees, like squash bee. Squash bee, the only thing that they're collecting pollen and nectar from are squashes. And as I said, the males actually sleep in the blossom. So if you're growing squashes, you look inside, you may see the females, but when the flowers are closed, if you gently grasp them and they start buzzing, those are males trying to sleep. Sweet potato vine bee, Melatoma toria. If you've got sweet potato vines or morning glory, you may see this black, this black and gray striped bee moving very quickly in and out between the flowers. Hibiscus bee, if you've got hibiscus, or even the exotic rose of Sharon. It looks a bit like a bumblebee. There are some differences, but it's rare to actually see a bumblebee in a hibiscus. Odds are you probably have a hibiscus bee. And for blueberries, the southeastern blueberry bee, 90 to 95% of its diet is just blueberry pollen and nectar. Another species that actually uses is redbud. So if you've got blueberries, you may actually have this bee. Now there are some species which people confuse with bees. So there are a number of flies, different types of hoverflies and flower flies, like this drone fly. 
Uh, you can see the banding pattern. They're just trying to pretend they are bees to get that protection. People thinking that they have actually a stinger. Some which actually do have stingers, but are not bees. These are the hornets and wasps. Uh, actually, this is not a true hornet. The one thing that you notice compared to bees, you do not see the hair on their body like you do with the bees. So they are designed really for capturing prey and feeding it to their young. Here's a paper wasp. Also, you notice there's no hair on the body for collecting pollen. Now, oftentimes I'll get someone saying, oh, I saw this bee and it was yellow and black. Now, I throw this picture in to kind of give you an idea. This is a European yellow jacket, which are yellow and black. This is the honeybee. And I said that before, the honeybee is varying color, but this one is kind of a burnt orange, sienna, amber with black, but you can see it is actually not yellow and black. So you can really see they are about the same size. Yellow jackets feed on meat. Honeybees feed on pollen and nectar. One of the few bees that we actually have around here, which is really yellow and black, are the wool carter bees. But you can see compared to the yellow jacket, they've got a short kind of squat uh, abdomen. They hover around and they're just very protective of their territories. So that was a quick breakdown, really to kind of give you an idea, but I've thrown in some pictures here of some bees you might find in your garden. And there are particular characteristics in there of some of the things we've talked about that hopefully you can start identifying, start identifying some of the species around here. So let's look at some of the bees in our garden. So the first one, what kind of bee is this? Some very interesting characteristics you can see in this picture. Um, for those of you who want to get involved in stuff, there's, there's unique venation in the wings, which are particular to this group too. But you start looking at the color and the patterning. So what do people think this bee is? I don't know if we have our results yet. Sixty-five percent honeybee. Very good. So some of the characteristics to notice, and sometimes it's harder to see, but you'll get used to it as you start looking. Notice the hairy eyes. This is peculiar to just this group of bees. They are the only bees that you'll ever find in North America with hairy eyes. The banding pattern too, as I said, it really is gonna uh, vary. They do, if you look at them from the front, they do have another heart-shaped head, but unlike the polyester bees, they also have these hairy eyes. What kind of bee is this? There's two big characteristics you can see in this picture to identify this group, this type of bee. People are voting, people are voting, they're guessing. Very good. So remember, hairy butt, bumblebee, shiny butt, uh, carpenter bee. And also notice here, it's got a pollen basket. Carpenter bees, as well as having a shiny butt, they're gonna collect pollen along their legs. It's only the bumblebees and the honeybees, which actually have these nice discrete packets where they actually pack the pollen with a little bit of nectar. So that's why it gives that sort of glossy look to it. So then, what kind of bee is this? Very obvious characteristic. Very common bee around here. I saw them today on our purple prairie clover, our white prairie clover, our bee balm, uh, obedient plant, Large carpenter bee. Yeah, and a big difference between the large carpenter bee and small carpenter bee, you'll notice later on, is the size. Large carpenter bee, oftentimes maybe about an inch long. The small carpenter bees, uh, maybe a quarter inch long or even smaller. What kind of bee is this?
one very obvious characteristic of this type of being. It's the only group that has this. The color may look like a variety of other things, but then one characteristic just sets this thing apart from any other type of bee. Longhorn bee, excellent. Notice those really long antennas. They're the only ones which have that. And these antenna, as you can see, they're almost the length of the body for the males. Now this one's kind of tricky. Um, it is characteristic, you might think of some other bee, but there's one thing which is really kind of obvious in this picture that hopefully helps you identify what type of bee it is. Yeah, the coloration, you know, I mentioned before that you know, there was a type of bee, one of the few black ones around here. Um, this is actually one of the only other ones. And actually an interesting story about this bee. Saw it a couple of years ago at our house in Dogtown and my wife pointed out, my wife is very good at identifying different types of bees, not necessarily the type of bee, but saying, hey, there's something different. And I first saw it and thought, oh, it's something else. And then when I actually started looking at it and seeing this particular characteristic show up, I knew it was something completely different than what I thought. What do people think it is? Leaf cutter bee, excellent. Now, as I mentioned before, um, one of the few black bees we have is a long, uh, two-spotted longhorn bee. But notice the pollen that's collected here. And that's how I actually noticed that it was something different when I saw it from a distance. Its whole abdomen started turning brilliant yellow from the sunflower pollen. What kind of bee is this? I'll kind of help you. It's, it is a smaller bee. That's uh, actually on tropical milkweed. So it is a smaller bee that you'd see in the garden. So what do people think? Sweat bee, excellent. You guys are doing great. So notice compared to the other small bees we have, so the mass bee would be all black with some yellow or white markings, but you wouldn't see the hair hairy bands on the abdomen. Uh, the uh, small carpenter bee would also, you'd see possibly ridges, but you wouldn't see these hairs. The small carpenter, bee, or the small sweat bees, they really do vary in color from browns to bronzes uh, to almost all black. We've got, I think, two more pictures to go. So what kind of bee is this? And I put it in with a particular feature that is peculiar to this bee. Also, it is one of the smaller bees, so that gives you a clue too, because if you see this in the garden, it is going to be a, a very small bee. So what do people think it is? Mass bee, close but it is actually a small carpenter bee. Now that is, it's a, a really good guess and you can potentially confuse them. Uh, remember that inverted T that you find, but yes, yeah, so that masked bee will tend to be a little bit broader here. It was really good that the majority of the votes were either a small carpenter bee or masked bee. So it really gets it down to two and then you start kind of learning. The masked bee, as I said, will also have additional markings on the the thorax here, white or yellow, and also some banding pattern. But it was a really good guess if you said mass B2 because it does have that patterning on its face too, kind of reminiscent. And then the final picture, what is this? And it has a couple characteristics, which I did not point out, but I will point out in a moment once we get past this poll. So 
So what do people think it is? People often get confused when they see some of these things in the garden. Cuckoo bee, fly. It is actually a fly. And I'm going to point out a couple of characteristics, which I didn't point out before, to really kind of help you identify some of the flies. First off, unlike any of the bees, they only have two wings. But this is often hard to really see. Two characteristics to really look at when you're looking at flies in the garden. One is they have very, usually very, very short antenna, whereas the bees, whether it be the longhorn bees, which have really long antenna, or even many of the others will have at least antenna coming out to about the size, you know, past the head. But one of the biggest characteristics is look at these eyes. So with any of the bees, you usually see a nice discrete, you know, eye on one side compound eye on the other. There's actually some smaller simple eyes. But on many of the flies, almost it looks like they've got this helmet, this wraparound shield, like a bullet. Um, you know, or for, you know, those who are into the Marvel you know, universe, like Juggernaut's helmet. It's really big protective, so they have these three almost, you know, full 180 degree and actually beyond vision. But it's this massive amount of eyes, which is really characteristic of the flies. Now, for those of you who want to get a little bit more information to start helping you identify and also start, you know, planning, as I said, our, our, the webinar on Thursday, we're going to start uh, talking about how to plant. But there's some books out there which do describe some of the different types of bees. So attracting native pollinators, it does go through the various genera of bees. The bumblebees of North America, if you're specifically just looking at the bumblebees, and then the bees in your backyard covers all the various genera of bees throughout North America, the whole diversity far beyond what even we've talked about today. And some books by Heather Holmes, excuse me, which I really enjoy, which really focus on the plant bee relations and some of the uh, plants and what types of bees are attracted to them. So bees and identification and native foraging plant and pollinators and native plants. And I really wanted to mention that the reason I'm doing this webinar and, and other webinars is there uh, some of you may have ever heard of a Senegalese ecology by the name of Baba Diem. And back in 1968, he gave this very profound statement, which really is kind of a calling card that we think about when we work at the St. Louis Zoo and other conservation organizations. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we have been taught. And that's why I've done this you know, first webinar on bee identification. So that start learning those bees, start identifying and seeing that diversity of bees. You start appreciating what you need to support them, the diversity in your own backyard. And as you start seeing changes, you start planting your gardens, you actually start seeing more and more diversity, which gives you a much better feeling. It's like seeing, you know, how many birds can you see in your backyard? Now, hopefully you can start seeing all the different types of bees in your backyard too. And with that, I thank you, and we will start answering some questions now. I know it went on a little bit beyond our time, but we had a basically full, full hour slated anyway. <laughs> so um, we have a couple great questions for you, Ed. The first is, could you elaborate on the difference between a social and non-social bee? Yes. So social bees are, when we think of particularly honeybees and bumblebees, they have a queen. They have a caste system, so there's a, a queen, the only breeding individual, and then all the workers. So the queens start the colony, they produce the first um, eggs, and then it's the workers doing all the work, and then after that point, they never leave. Most bees, and we're talking over 90% of all bees, are not social. They are solitary, though they don't mind living next to each other. So for example, many of the uh, leaf cutters, if you set up a bee hotel, a bee block, maybe a series of holes, just like living in an apartment complex, you don't mind living next to your neighbor, but you're not actually living with your neighbor. There's no real social relationship between you. So I can tolerate you, but we're not doing things together. When you think about social bees, they're doing things together to support the young, to develop, uh, to raise, to help maintain the queen and raise the next generation. All right. 
Um, this question, I actually have the same question, so I'm glad that Kay asked. Why are they called sweat bees? Sweat bees are, are interesting. The, the family Helictidae, actually Helictus refers to salt. So many of the species uh, like to land on people when they're sweaty and collect that salt. Now they're using that salt. You know, it's, there's still some question as to what all they're using the salt for. It's additional nutrients, additional minerals. The interesting thing is, uh, for those of you who know me and ever see me out photographing bees, I'm often sweating a lot and I rarely have a sweat bee on me. Um, and you think, hey, they're sweat bees. They're all around me. Why aren't they landing on me? Uh, but these are the ones which will land on you, and particularly the smaller Lassie blossoms in particular uh, are the ones. And just by sheer luck, and I'm just gonna embarrass my wife in the other room just briefly. The only picture I have of sweat bees really on people, they landed on her. So I actually was able to get pictures of a sweat bee on sweat. All right, that leads to another question we had. Um, those are some great pictures of bees, Ed. Are they all your pictures? Yes, those are all my pictures. Um, I spend a lot of time, the, the beautiful thing is I tell people about digital photography, you can keep taking pictures and pictures, you throw out all the rubbish, and it's amazing sometimes you get a good picture. You do get uh, used to uh, their behaviors and how to photograph, and for some species of bees, you actually have to kind of learn their, their patterns. So like that, uh, uh, the sweet potato vine bee, they're going in and out of morning glories, but if you watch them, they start doing a pattern. You start seeing which ones they keep going to, and then you just kind of set up your camera in front of one, and then hopefully it stops before it flies right out. Uh, but all those pictures are mine, um, and I spend a lot of time trying to get those best pictures to, to tell the stories. I can vouch that I have found you like with all of your lenses hanging out in Missouri Meadow before, had some great conversations about bees out there while you were getting your... Yeah, I think it's also screwed up my knees too because I used to do a lot of squatting and now that I'm getting older, my knees can't deal with the squatting too much anymore. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions actually um, about bee boxes. So since we have sure. a lot of partners, I think People want to know, um, are those bee boxes that you can buy that are made out of um, bamboo or wood, are those good to use? What kind of maintenance do these bee houses need to have? Do you need to clean them, replace them? What do you need to do to make sure you're caring for your bees? Right, so there are a variety of different, what are called bee hotels, bee condos, bee apartments, bee blocks, etc. Uh, they can range from just a simple block of wood with holes drilled into it to some of the more elaborate with a series of bamboo uh, tubes, et cetera. The, the one thing that concerns me about many of the ones that you find online is they tend to be too shallow. And this is which gets into how bees reproduce. So bees are what are called haplodiploid, meaning that males are produced from a non-fertilized egg, females are produced by a fertilized egg. So they're diploid, males are haploid. So, a female bee can actually determine what the sex of her offspring is by whether to incorporate sperm into the egg or not. Now with these bee hotels, female eggs are laid usually in the back, males in the front, uh, because males are a little more expendable. So if you do have like a woodpecker or some sort of wasp trying to come through the front, you lose a couple males, it's okay, the females are more valuable. But when the tubes are, are shallower, a female may actually produce more males. It actually skews the relationship. So what I recommend to people, if you purchase one of these things or you make it yourself, there are some general uh, rules of thumb. We have some on our, the website too. But if the hole is less than a quarter inch in diameter, the hole should be three to four inches deep. If it is a quarter inch or more, it should be five to six inches deep. And most of those bee hotels are not set up for that sort of distance. And so that's what you want to do. For maintenance, you usually want to, uh, the bees themselves will actually clean out the, uh, the holes each year, but usually after about two to three years, you really want to replace them uh, because they will start filling up with uh, debris, sometimes fungus, mites. One way to get around that, you can sometimes line them with a paper, uh, with a lining of paper and just remove that each year so it alleviates the cleaning process. All right. 
A uh, couple more questions. We'll try to get them in before five here. Oh, um, I'm, I'm available after five. I'm fine. <laughs> well, our room's not available after. Oh, okay. Five. Well, there's a problem. To, yeah, I know. We could go all day otherwise. <laughs> and I'll be talking about more of these things on Thursday, too. So. Yeah, for sure. These are great questions. So um, are the bees that you were talking about today active at different times of day? Um, do they tend to go throughout the day? When will you best see the bees? So usually the best time to see bees are the best time for people to be up. So it's like butterflying too. Usually like 11 to two, best time. But the one thing that's most characteristic is if those flowers are in sun. So for example, if you have flowers which are in sun in the morning, you will tend to see bees on there. If they go into shade in the afternoon, you don't tend to see the bees. So look around in your garden or wherever you're looking for bees, if there's sun on those flowers. So for example, in our garden, we have flowers on the north side of our house, the west side, the east side, the south side. So depending upon which, where the sun is, uh, even though something is really attractive to bees, like when our uh, American plums were in bloom, yeah, bees are all over it. But when it went into shade, you started seeing a reduction in the bees. The biggest thing that's important, and as I said, I'll also talk about on Thursday, is different types of bees are active at different times of the year. So the mason bees tend to be only in spring, so April and May. The longhorn bees are really a summer species. So really, you know, late June, July, August. Um, the mining bees in the spring, though there is like one, at least two species of fall mining bees that are found around here. Bumblebees can be found throughout the year, honeybees throughout the year, small carpenters, but some bees are very dependent upon the season and the plants that are there. All right. Um... What is a furrow bee? So, yeah, so that's actually, I just learned this term too. So on iNaturalist, they have what's called a furrow bee. Uh, that is the genus Helictus. And I tried to, because I had never heard this common name of a furrow bee. So like the legated furrow bee is Helictus legatus. And what I found out is furrow is referring to a hole or a trench. So the Helictus and and all those bees are ground nesting bees. So it has nothing to do with the furrow in their head. It's actually how they're nesting. So it's actually a hole and not a furrow. So that's what gets really kind of confusing. But those brown striped sweat bees, uh, genus Helictus, um, I've literally, I've just learned over the past few weeks are often count, called furrow bees. And particularly in iNaturalist, they're called furrow bees. Um. So this other question, with carpenter bee nests, do woodpeckers go after the larva? Yes. So we had one carpenter bee nest in our backyard. We have a, a wooden privacy fence and the two by four cross member of one of the gates, the uh, bee actually uh, drilled into the bottom and then actually went along the length inside. But you, you couldn't see that, you saw the hole in the bottom. But woodpeckers found it and there was a series of holes drilled right into the outside that they, they used. So depending upon the type of wood, if a woodpecker can get to it, things like a two by four where the bee will actually run the length of it, it's easier for woodpeckers to get to it. If it's more of a block of wood, uh, something a little bit deeper, or even a tree trunk, that you know, dead tree, then it's harder for woodpeckers to get to it. But they will go for the, the young. All right, I think we're gonna make this happen, Ed. We have one more question and we have one more question. Okay. So um, Colleen says, what is the sting in bee sting? So if someone is allergic, what is happening? So the sting itself is a whole series of different proteins, peptides, which types of proteins. So when the bee stings, um, what you're actually receiving, what you're getting that, that pain is your body's reaction to a foreign chemical being put into you. Now, honeybees and what I tell people, the only bees I concern myself at all about anywhere is, is only a honeybee or a bumblebee, but only at the colony, at the nest, because there they're protecting the queen, they're protecting their sisters, all resources, and they may be a little more defensive. But when a bee is on a flower, they could care less about you. All they want to do is collect pollen and nectar, just food and drink for themselves or for the kids. They don't want to do anything. And for most of these bees, many of the species don't have a stinger strong enough to go through your skin. And some, like some of the sweat bees, it's just like a little pinprick. It's nothing to worry about. All right. 
Well, with that, we're pretty much out of time. Thank you so much, Ed. You are one of the most knowledgeable people I have ever met in my life. And it's always so interesting to hear from you. Right. Um, we'll have another webinar Thursday, more about plants um, and via pollinators. And um, this will be, this has been recorded. We'll have it on our website as soon as we can so that if you have friends who uh, you think would enjoy learning about how to identify bees, you can all share away. So okay. one, one final point too is, and I'm happy to answer any questions outside of this. So if you want to contact me by email, and I always forget to put my email address, it's spivak, S-P-E-V-A-K, at stlzoo.org. And I know I actually got an earlier email just today from a uh, question from someone about bees. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to answer them. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much. We'll see you all later. Thank you. Bye.